Cyber attacks are now the number one concern in the C-suite. Why can't they stop this? It's pretty staggering. This enterprise of criminals is now in the tune of six to seven trillion dollars. The pace is frenetic. Risks are at an all-time high. It sounds pretty scary. Billions and billions of dollars of impact. Nobody sits well on that decision to pay. So what happens with our clients when something happens to us? I'm excited about this one. It was into the small hours of what was technically Saturday morning, but actually, it was still Friday night. Earlier that evening, a group of hackers broke into the network of an undisclosed company, gained access to proprietary data, and immediately demanded money in return for it. They call this a ransomware attack. And it set off a mad scramble at the firm. Hey, what book are you reading? It's not a book, it's real life. This actually happened at a company. Really? What happened? <clears throat> well, posing as a company IT manager, an outside negotiator was called in from a cybercrime prevention firm. This one was called Arate, and it's full of former military espionage types. They began negotiating with the hackers and used encrypted messages to discuss the demands. Back and forth, the two sides went. Then, after more than eight hours and dozens of messages, the negotiator finally reached a deal. The company would deliver a payment via Bitcoin in exchange for the release of the data. Or so this negotiator thought. Well, you got me hooked now. The hackers came back with one more demand. They wanted an extra 20% payment into a separate account using a different cryptocurrency. And the firm got its data back. These hackers, man, they are really bad dudes. You think maybe we should change our usernames and passwords? Which ones? All of them? Hi, this is Jill Wildfong, Chief Marketing Officer for Corn Ferry, and this is Briefings, our deep dive into the world of leadership. Today we're looking at cybercrime, specifically ransomware attacks where hackers extort firms for their data. According to one watchdog group, there were more than 490 million ransomware cases globally last year, costing companies over $450 million. Truly, any company's business can be ruined by these hackers, some of whom are organized as well as any S&P firm. It's so bad that one survey found that among all the issues firms have, cyber attacks are now the number one concern in the C-suite, more than even the economy. But there is hope, and it comes from a select group of so-called cyber crime prevention firms. These outfits operate in the shadows of ransomware attacks. And we're going to talk today to one of these very cyber knight in shining armors and hear how it works. What's at stake behind your money or your data? Please welcome Joe Mann, CEO of cybercrime prevention firm Arite Incident Response. He's helped firms out of some major jams, so it's great to have him here to give us a rare glimpse into this seemingly cloak and dagger world of ransomware. Hi, Joe. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Jill. Thank you for having me. Have you ever met any of these uh, ransomware hackers? What are what are they like? What's the what's the profile of these types of people? Most of these people feel as if they're you know, they're just bringing food home to their family. We kind of create this fantasy idea of who these people are. They used to be hooded in sweatshirts and they used to be, um, you know, these evil geniuses. It's not like that anymore. It's, um, it's very organized and they live in a government that, um, that makes it legal for them to do these things and is kind of just a regular job. So Joe was so much at stake why is it so hard to stop them? What what's what's preventing us from being able to really attack this on our on our side as as business leaders and, and stop this? There's a number of things at play here. One, uh, this industry, if you look at cyber crime, has doubled every year for the last five years to the point where the FBI is now saying that this uh, enterprise or complex of 
criminals is now in the tune of six to seven trillion dollars, which would make this enterprise of criminals as large as the third largest GDP just above Japan. So when you think of the size and volume that that kind of economic annual economic uh, gain creates, um, it's pretty staggering. There's also a new kind or newish kind of ransomware, which is called ransomware as a service. So there's like gangs that all they do is write the malware, the ransomware. They don't even do, they don't even hack people. And they sell it as a subscription model. You don't even need to know how to write malware. Mm. You can just take somebody else's malware, infect victims, and then pay the, the creators like 10%, 5%, whatever it is. That's Lorenzo Franceschi Bicieri of Motherboard speaking. So, Joe... Did we hear that right? Is there a whole subculture creating malware that criminals can buy? The reason that's driving this is the the hackers have seen that with increased scrutiny from government agencies, increased law enforcement, where we've seen takedowns occur, why um, take that risk? Are you seeing AI written malware out in the real world now, or is this just theoretical? No, no, it's not theoretical. We've seen real malware that was written by AI that exploited these tools and uh, created the uh, real attacks, and some of them even quite sophisticated attacks. Some of them even used the uh, unknown uh, zero-day uh, risks. That's Checkpoint Software CEO Gil Schved on the effect artificial intelligence is having. Joe, first of all, what is this zero-day risks? What, what's that mean? A zero-day attack is is um, the point in which the, the takedown occurred. So it's a sophisticated attack that most commercial software today won't be able to block. Last year, we saw a big downturn in the number of attacks here in the U.S., not in Asia, but here in the U.S. Um, this year, we've seen a big spike upward, and that generative AI um, and AI-built malware is certainly playing a role in that. Yeah, it sounds uh, like really like the stuff of fiction, and I guess if only they were, right? Uh, thank you so much for coming on. I, I've appreciated your time today. Thank you, Jill. The first barrier to increasing adoption of cybersecurity best practices is is ensuring awareness among business management and business leaders uh, to make sure that when companies are deciding where to invest and which risks to invest in driving down, cybersecurity and the risk of ransomware attacks is seen as a top priority risk. That's Eric Goldstein of the United States Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency urging companies to raise their awareness around cybersecurity security. But beyond knowing that there's a cyber boogeyman out there willing to steal your data, how can companies protect themselves? We'll find out after the break. Hi, I'm Rupak Bhattacharya and welcome to The Break. Here's what else is happening in the world of business from Corn Ferries this week in Leadership. Now some companies are offering incentives to those who come into the office more regularly. The return to office debate rages on, and in a sign that leaders are switching from the stick to the carrot, a new survey of 400 U.S. CEOs found that fully 90% said they're willing to reward office-based employees with favorable assignments, raises, or promotions. Many of the CMOs that we work with, all the marketing leaders we have real contact with, have a challenge in convincing their CFO. Is there a troubling disconnect in the C-suite? According to the CMO Council, only 22% of CMOs describe themselves as very willing to collaborate with their CFO peers on such critical issues as investments, metrics, and goals. A new salary transparency law took effect that requires most employers to provide good faith salary ranges on job posts. Multiple U.S. states are now enacting laws making it mandatory to disclose salary ranges and job postings. However, only 17% of firms have implemented a strategy of pay transparency, according to a new survey from Corn Ferry. For more insights on business and leadership, head to cornferry.com insights. Now back to Jill and our episode on your money or your data. So we're back and we're talking about cybercrime, your money or your data. I'm now joined by Craig Stevenson, Managing Director of Corn Ferry's North America CIO and CTO Practices. Hi, Craig. 
Hi, Jill. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Craig, give us a little insight into how the world of chief information and chief technology officers are feeling about all of this. There has to be huge looming pressures on them. Well, Jill, there absolutely is. And I think CIOs and CTOs are at the core of a lot of these discussions, a lot of the pressure that's occurring, and obviously they're locking arms in concert with chief information security officers. So uh, all in all, it's a very dynamic space. It's a very dynamic environment. Uh, The pace is frenetic. Risks are at an all-time high, a variety of reasons for that. Uh, But I think all in all, a lot of technology leaders, CIOs and CTOs, and their counterparts, chief information security officers, lose sleep on a rather consistent basis based on the number of threats that are occurring on a daily basis. The thing is, it's not just up to the government to take cybersecurity a lot more seriously. Companies and private individuals have to step up too. And there are some basic things that we should all absolutely be doing here. First, set up multi-factor authentication. Seriously, do it right now. Second, keep your computers up to date and also don't click on suspicious emails. And I know that those meshes sound small when we're facing something so terrifying, but in a world where most people's doors are unlocked and wide open, just locking your door might be something of a deterrent here. That's John Oliver, host of HBO's Last Week Tonight. Uh, Craig, we have just heard how sophisticated these cyber villains are. So are these crime-fighting steps that companies take? They they sound kind of simple. Well, I think they're simple in theory, Jill, but I think theoretically and practically, they're incredibly challenging. So you take global enterprises, for example, what's happening here is not necessarily what's happening there. Um, You've got senior level executives with different, um, you know, potential areas of thought and or focus or agenda. Um, You've got talent considerations. Do we have the right individuals that are, you know, within the organization um, and and is the structure and the culture and the education uh, broadly uh, defined kind of helping shape uh, employee behavior to avoid some of those risks? But I I think while all of that happens, new risks are entering the equation. In a survey of board directors from the Wall Street Journal, when asked about their readiness to deal with a cyber crisis, Craig, only three in 10 directors rated their board as having an advanced or expert level of preparedness. What should boards be doing differently, if anything, to, to get ready? I think in terms of reaction to a ransomware event, oftentimes you're you're kind of caught by surprise. A lot of firms have not prepared kind of response to that crisis management. Just Mm -hmm. last week, a client called me and said, so what happens with our clients when something happens to us? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just starting to figure out who's responsible. Obviously, it's a team game. Multiple people are responsible, um, but we need someone on point who's going to be running uh, efforts and energy against these events when they actually unfold and occur. But, you know, from a board perspective, we're making some some really good progress. Makes sense. I think my my to do is to... uh change that uh, Jill1234 email password. A little too obvious, Jill. A little too obvious. (laughs) All All right, Craig. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. The executive producer of Briefings is Jonathan Dahl. Today's episode was produced by Rupak Bhattacharya, Chelsea Starks, Nadira Putri, and Teresa Allen, and edited by Jaron Henry McRae. It contains reporting by Russell Perlman, Ariane Cohen, and Peter Loria. Our video segment contains original artwork by Fraser Milton, Haley Kennel, Jonathan Pink, and Sasha Kutschuk. Don't forget to read our magazine, available at newsstands and at cornferry.com slash briefings. That's it for Corn Fairy's Briefings. I'm Jill Wilkfong. We'll see you next time. <laughs>